this week kind of took a, an interesting turn in, in terms of what I was looking at and how I thought this was going to go. Um, I, had, I had originally sort of planned on walking very much through um, the aspects of exile for the Israelites and then kind of capping that off at the end to talk about what that means for us. And as I was praying and preparing, um, the Lord kind of flipped that and said, no, I just want you to run through the exile really, really quick. And then the big chunk is going to be what it means now. So things just kind of got flipped a little bit. Um, so I just want to go through um, in terms of what we're talking about as far as exile and, and what, what specific part of um, the Israelites and what they were facing. Um, what that means and, and, and what it looked like. So we're talking about right now, we're talking about the Jewish people in exile, but this is during the Babylonian captivity. Now that's important because, yes, there were other times that the Israelites were under the control of other people and other um, governments and, and foreign countries and those kind of things. Yes, they were, in, they were under uh, bondage in Egypt in Exodus chapter 6. There were several nations in the book of Judges. And when the northern kingdom fell to Assyria a few centuries before, in, that would be in 2 Kings chapter 14. So all of those things are periods of exile, but those happened before what we are focusing on today. Today is the Babylonian captivity. And that affected Israel in much more catastrophic ways when that took place. King Nebuchadnezzar laid siege to the temple in Jerusalem. He destroyed the temple. He took all the things that he wanted from it. He destroyed the surrounding walls to the city. The Israelites that were left behind barely managed to survive. And when the exiles did return, which would be 70 years later, several remnant Israelites married foreigners. They were cast out of Israelite society. So the things that took place, the things that would start to go wrong, had long-term consequences. Many prophets tried to be obedient to the Lord and share warnings with the people, and they simply wouldn't listen. They didn't listen, and as a result, God allowed them to face the consequences. That included Jeremiah, Obadiah, Joel, Isaiah, Ezekiel, Habakkuk, Nahum, Zephaniah. All these people were sent, and they all had words of truth for the Israelites, and yet they kept turning away. Now, many of those prophets didn't experience the events, but they foresaw what was to come. It filled them with great fear and despair. But, and this is the good news, the, probably the best news of today, is that even in that fear, even in that despair, God was always there to fill them with hope and to remind them that restoration would be possible. He was always there to reassure them of Israel's future. Meaning, if it had a future, Everything wasn't going to end, right? Now, there's three reasons why, there's at least, at least three, I should say, reasons why Israel was forced into this captivity. The first was because of idolatry and rebellion. God told Israel to have no other gods before him, and he meant it. And he meant it for their good. And yet, they wanted what they wanted. They wanted to worship Baal. They had Asherah poles that they were praying to. There were other foreign gods. They placed all of that stuff on equal footing with their God that they knew. And as a result, everything sort of fell apart. God decided, fine, if that's what you want, I will give you over to those desires. The second was a trust issue. Israel had many trust issues. But the trust issue here that matters is that they started to trust in foreign powers. They started to trust that, okay, you know what? We're not really sure what God's going to do here, but we know that Egypt can help us. And Egypt helped them for a little bit. And then Egypt fell. And as a result, Israel had no one. So they fell too. Again, God asked them to trust in him, and they tried to look elsewhere for that help. The last was due to injustice. Not only did the kingdom of Judah sin against God, but they sinned against their neighbors. We know those commandments. Love the Lord your God and love your neighbor as yourself. And they were violating this. God doesn't take injustice lightly. They had been, to use scripture, they had been cruel to orphans, widows, foreigners, the poor, and the destitute. 
And as a result, God would help them to understand what that felt like. So because of those three things, they are punished. They're taken away from the land that they know, and they're brought into Babylonian captivity. Now, it might seem like a severe punishment, but again, I want us to remember this today. God's grace continued. In fact, it continued for hundreds of years during Israel's sin. While they were doing all this, while they were turning away, his grace did not disappear. He gave plenty of opportunity to turn from their sin, and they simply chose not to. During the reign of several good kings, such as Hezekiah and Josiah, they did turn for a little bit, for a short period of time. And yet when it came to the big picture, they simply just gave up on God, and they turned away. Eventually, the consequences of their sins would catch up to them, and that leads to the captivity. And yet, most importantly, while their sin brought consequence, it did not permanently damage their relationship with God. So that's what I want you to hear today. Yes, sin has consequence. And yes, we will face them when we sin. But it never permanently damages the choice or the chance for restoration and redemption in the Lord Jesus Christ. Sin never fully takes that away if we decide to turn from it and turn to him. Now we're going to dig in further on the promises of the scripture that Ellen read today. But before we do that, I want to look at the aspects of exile that we are facing today. And in order to do that, if you're, if you're taking notes, this is what we're going to look at. We're going to look at this world as a whole. We're going to look at our world as individuals, and we're going to look at the eternal world. It starts with this world, as in the big picture earth that we live on as society. I'm not going to tell you anything you don't know. We're in trouble. The world's in trouble. You know that. Sin runs rampant throughout society, and it distorts everything. Truth is no longer absolute, but relative in the eyes of most individuals. Much of language is taken out of context. Syntax is changed so that sentences are put together to mean whatever we want them to mean. And you never quite know what is what, which end is up, right? And it changes day by day. We know that in Genesis 3, that sin broke God's intended image for his people. So there's a brokenness here. Sin has entered the world, and as a result, mankind is broken. That is, without the Lord. It's why today, instead of people looking through his lens, they make the choice to look through their own lens. Instead of seeing how and why God made them, they want a sense of self that comes before everything and anything else. And as soon as self becomes our focus, we're in trouble, right? Who we think we are is whatever we want to be, even if there is no logic or evidence that proves that. Human desire is key. Society tells us that we should be able to be and have whatever we want, no matter what that is and no matter what that means. That mentality has been disastrous. And why? All because of sin. Self and sin go hand in hand. And as soon as our desires become greater than those around us, and certainly greater than the Lord's, again, we are in real trouble. As a result, and again, I struggle with this statement a little bit because maybe it never was, but certainly today, in 2023, Christianity is no longer mainstream. To many, what we believe 
and you're going to have to hear me out on this because this is going to sound really harsh, but to many, what we believe is one of two things. It's either a myth and completely false, or it's simply a form of hate and bigotry. Those are the only two choices the world gives us, really, in many ways. I say that because without proper understanding, people take much of what we believe as a threat to culture. And in a sense, it is, but not in the way that they think it is. If you need specifics, think about the way that views on gender, marriage, and sexuality have changed and continue to change, not only day by day, I would say minute by minute. Think of the things that you see that have been normalized, that are just changing continually, and think about what you would have thought of that 30 years ago. Think about what you would have thought about that five years ago, sometimes six months ago. I mean, it is that quickly changing, it is rapidly changing in a way that makes no sense other than to know that sin is at the heart of it. The idea that we are created in God's image perfectly as he intended, meaning that gender isn't fluid, that marriage was created solely as a union for one man and one woman, that acting out on heterosexual desires outside of marriage is wrong, that acting out on homosexual desires is wrong in any fashion. All of those things put us at odds with the world. All of it. The world says that we only have two choices. We can either affirm people for who they are and what they do, or we can hate them for their choices. Those are the two that the world gives us. We either affirm or we hate. It's not reality, but it's what the world has decided and it's how the world wants to view any reaction towards what they do as individuals. And yet here's the truth. As followers of Jesus, we may not agree with what people do. We, not, we may not agree with what people believe. We might not agree with how they are shaping the way their life looks, but we are commanded to love them no matter what. If we are obedient to Jesus, we choose to do that. In an oversimplified reality, this world is not our home. We are in a foreign land. We are speaking a different language than those around us. It brings obstacles as you would expect, but the important thing to remember is that God is the one who gives us the capacity and the ability to be able to love no matter what. Listen to these verses from 1 Peter. This is chapter 1, starting with verse 22, and it says this. Now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth, so that you have sincere love for your brothers, love one another deeply from the heart. For you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and enduring word of God. For all men are like grass, and all their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of the Lord stands forever. And this is the word that was preached to you. Therefore, rid yourselves of all malice and all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander of every kind. Like newborn babies, crave pure spiritual milk, so that by it you may grow up in your salvation, now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by men, but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus. Jesus Christ. Now, think about that. Peter is telling us there, and he's saying it very clearly. Truth and love are not at odds. They go hand in hand, one in the same. Unfortunately, the world doesn't see it that way. The world would like us to just simply love and leave it there. But I will tell you this today. I want us to be a church that not only clings to the truth, but holds firm to the truth and loves people through it. I do not want to be a church that simply just 
has good feelings about everything and shows love and kindness to everyone but isn't willing to talk about the truth of the gospel. I also don't want to be a church that takes the truth of the gospel and just walks up to people and punches them in the face with it. That's not who we are supposed to be. That is not who God expects us to be. We do not have to agree with the world around us. We do not have to affirm poor or wrong choices. But we do have to be able to talk to people, to build relations with, relationships with them and walk through these things in a loving manner that shows Jesus Christ to people, that can talk about the fact that there are things that are wrong, that there is sin in this world, but that we are going to stand firm in the truth of Jesus because he loves us and because he loves them. If we can't talk about it that way, we're failing and we're going to lose. We already have the odds stacked against us. And if we cannot balance truth and love, if we cannot be that church, a church that stands firm in truth and loves through it, we're not going to be here another hundred years. That's the world we are living in. That scripture tells us he would be rejected, and so will we. We will be rejected. And our choice, even in that rejection, is to continue to build relationships, to continue to show love, to continue to show what it means to have Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord of our lives and show people that there is a way out of the hell they are choosing to live in today. So listen, let's go back to the scripture today from Isaiah. This is verses, this is chapter 35, verses 1 and 2. And uh, here's another thing that might be important for you to know. Isaiah 34 is a really rough chapter because Isaiah 34 is basically telling the people eternal damnation is a thing. It exists, it is reality, and for people that make that choice, that will be what happens. But God, again, in his goodness and in his faithfulness, does not leave it there. That brings us to 35. Verses 1 and 2, the desert and the parched land will be glad. The wilderness will rejoice and blossom. Like the crocus, it will burst into bloom. It will rejoice greatly and shout for joy. The glory of Lebanon will be, a, will be given to it. The splendor of Carmel and Sharon, they will see the glory of the Lord, the splendor of our God. The words for joy and singing here set the tone for the entire chapter. Heaven is not simply going to be a place that is the absence of hell but more importantly, the eternal presence of Jesus Christ and the joy and peace and everything that is good about him that come with it. In other words, there will be a wilderness. We are in that now, but it will not remain that way. God is going to transform this earth again back into the garden. We know from scripture that even all of nature is eagerly looking forward to this. Romans 8, 19, for the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. I mean, think about that. Nature itself knows of the curse in Genesis 3, where sin comes in and everything is broken. Not just mankind, but everything is broken. And nature itself knows that. It knows it will be set free from that curse in Genesis 3 and share in the glory of king, in the kingdom. Those lands that are described there, even those most fruitful and beautiful places on this earth will be simply diminished in comparison to what the Lord is going to bring. There will be no more parched ground because the land will once again be brought to perfection through Jesus Christ. So now let's talk a little bit about our world. That's the world. So let's talk about our world a little bit. And this gets us to chap chapter 35 again. This is verses 3 through 7. Strengthen the feeble hands, steady the knees that give way. Say to those with fearful hearts, be strong. Do not fear, your God will come. He will come with vengeance. With divine retribution, he will come to save you. 
Then will the eyes of the blind be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then will the lame leap like a deer and the mute tongue shout for joy. Water will gush forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. The burning sand will become a pool, the thirsty ground bubbling springs in the haunts where jackals once lay, grass and reeds and papyrus will grow. Now some of that might sound almost metaphorical, you know, when you think about like the land where jackals lay and then thinking about there being growth there, that, that may be part of it. But what I want you to hear today is this. Isaiah uses the promise of the coming kingdom to strengthen those here who are weak and afraid. He doesn't only do that to strengthen those people. He does that, and God uses that to strengthen us as his people today. Yes, this world can be a very terrible place. But you know, sometimes we don't need to turn on the news to know that or to feel it. Sometimes that's happening in our own hearts. Sometimes that's happening in our own homes. Sometimes that's happening all around us in all of our individual circumstances. What then? Because honestly, your wilderness may be so different than someone else's that all you can think is nobody gets it. Nobody understands where I'm at. Nobody understands what I'm facing on a day-to-day -day basis. And yes, people might mean well, but they don't get it. I'm alone and I don't know what to do. I think if we're honest with ourselves, we all have those moments. I will tell you personally that this past probably week or 10 days or so has been incredibly discouraging. I'm not gonna get into why and it doesn't even really matter, but it has been. And yet this is the God that we serve. Moment by moment over the last three days specifically, at every single moment where the Lord knew what I needed, I received it. At every turn where I needed to know I'm not alone, at every turn where I needed to know somebody understands, at every turn where I wanted to know you are loved, at every turn where I wanted to know that God had not left me, he let it be known. And I wasn't anticipating that. I wasn't even really looking for it, to be honest with you, because sometimes in our discouragement, we get lost in there. But God knew. God knew exactly what we were facing. He knew exactly what we needed, and he knew the exact timing of when we needed to hear it. I praise him for that today. Because it's the reminder that yes, we are going to have, and again, I'm not trying to be over dramatic. We are going to have times of wilderness. And I'm not even saying that's where I was at. But for some of us and for some of the time in our lives, that's exactly where we find ourselves. And in those moments of wilderness, that scripture is telling us, be strong because God is with you. He is not going to leave. He is going to walk through this with you, and there is going to be an eternal promise in the end. All of our suffering, all of the brokenness, all of those things are going to change. It means all dryness is going to experience the water of life. It means all brokenness is going to made, be made whole. It means that all emptiness is going to be made full, renewed, and restored in Jesus Christ. He is promising us that in the day-to-day, -day, no matter how lost we might feel, no matter how lost things might seem, no matter how heavy life might feel at the time, we are not alone. We do not face any of those challenges without our Heavenly Father by our side. And not only is He with us, but He understands. He knows the pain of loss. 
He knows what sadness looks like. He's experienced heartache. He has felt completely alone. It's part of the great wonder of his love for us that he came to earth so that we would know he understands those things. He has been in that wilderness, and he has been alone there. And yet even still, the reason for it, he was alone so that we would know he gets it. He was alone. He was by himself. He suffered because he wanted us to know that when he says, I understand, he means it. It's what this story is telling us. Day to day, God understands what we are going through. So yes, you might feel very much like you're in wilderness this morning, but you are not alone. And Jesus Christ is not only God up here and far away and distant, he is intimately with us in all of the details. So that gets us to verses 8 through 10. Now we're going to look at the eternal world. It says, and a highway will be there. It will be called the way of holiness. The unclean will not journey on it. It will be for those who walk in that way. Wicked fools will not go about on it. No lion will be there, nor will any ferocious beast get up on it. They will not be found there, but only the redeemed will walk there, and the ransom of the Lord will return. They will enter Zion with singing. Everlasting joy will crown their heads. Gladness and joy will overtake them, and sorrow and sighing will flee away. Gladness and joy will overtake them. So again, why does... Why does Isaiah used this imagery. I mean, this highway thing kind of sounds a little bit out there, right? But there is an actual grounded reason for that example. Because during the Assyrian invasion, and that would have been for the northern kingdom, the highways were not safe. There was nowhere to travel. For those who did not just fall in line, they could not get from place to place in safety. During the kingdom age, though, that's going to change. There is a way of safety. At that point, it's not just the narrow road that we choose to walk alone as followers of Christ rather than the wide path that the world wants us to take. This is one special highway, the way of holiness. In ancient cities, there were often special roads that only kings and priests could use. That was sort of one of the ways they had some security. It was just understood those were going to be the only people that could be there. That is not the case here. There is no qualification other than simply accepting Jesus that puts us on this road. And on this road, we are safe. On this road, we are headed to an eternal life with Jesus. When Isaiah spoke and wrote these words, the land was ravaged, crops were destroyed. Again, travel was completely unsafe. It wasn't a good place. The people were trapped in Jerusalem. They were wondering what would happen next. The members of the faithful remnant were trusting in God, but even they were fearful they didn't know what was coming. And yet they, pray, they prayed to God for his help, and he answered. He prayed, they prayed for help, and he supplied it. If he kept his promises to those people centuries ago, if he delivered those people centuries ago, he is going to do the same for us. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. The same God that delivered these people in the midst of just absolute chaos is saying to us today and promising us today as his people, you are going to be delivered. No, in many ways, this is not your home. But I'm asking you to remain faithful 
in this wilderness. I am asking you to remain faithful in this exile. And if you do it, you will travel safely, you will be with me, and you are going to experience an eternity like no other, like nothing you can possibly imagine. As Rochelle already mentioned in that reading today, God's purpose was not simply to bring the people out of exile. It was not to bring his people out of exile, those specific people. His ultimate plan, the ultimate plan in this story is to bring the world out of exile. He wants as many people as possible to be saved and to be with him. And, you know, obviously I'm jumping ahead in the story here, but think about it this way, because this is, I think that this is, this might be my favorite example of God's love to his people. And when I say his people, I mean all people. The idea that in Revelation, the world is ending, everything is decaying. It's all coming to an end, and it's to a degree where you just go, I don't even know how anyone's even alive anymore. And yet there are angels flying overhead saying, repent, the Lord is near. What more evidence do we need that we serve a God who loves us, that we serve a God who wants more than anything for everyone to be saved? It's so far gone at that point. Everything is done. People have made their choices. I mean, we could look at it that way. And yet in this complete devastation, repent, the Lord is near. He is still with us. He is still loving us. He is still looking down and saying, Please just come be with me. I love you that much. Again, as his people, we are waiting for Jesus. We are waiting for the return of the kingdom. In the midst of our weakness, in the midst of our sin, as life throws everything at us, we can still cling to the promise of a Savior. No matter what life looks like, no matter how deep the valley, no matter how far from him we might feel, the promise of a savior is here. He is consistently emphasizing the gift of eternal life throughout scripture for all who would believe. It is his greatest promise. And yes, we might feel like we're in exile today. Yes, we live in a world that is sometimes just hard to believe. We're surrounded by so much pain and destruction and devastation. And yet in the midst of that awfulness, we have the joy and the peace that can only come from Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. That's what he wants for you today. If you don't know him, that's what he wants. He wants for you to be able to examine where you're at, to repent of the things that you know are wrong and simply say to the Lord, please, take me as I am. Take everything I, everything I have. I want to be in a relationship with you. I want to live with you in eternity. I want to be the kind of person that I can only be in you. I want to be able to see all of the pain and the things around this world and, the, and that that black and white choice of the world to either affirm or hate. And I want to be able to show that that's not true. I can show your love. I can cling to your truth and I can show your love through it all. It is only possible in Jesus. So as we close today, that's it. If you don't know him, he wants to be in a relationship with you. If you don't know what that looks like, if you don't know how to do that, all you have to do is ask. But that's what we're here for. Not just me. There are many people in this place 
who would walk through that with you, who would talk through that with you, who would pray through that with you. What we want for this place is to be a place, again, that stands firm in truth and loves through it all, even in the midst of exile. Thank you.